Thank you, Chuck, for that very kind introduction, and thank you all for being here at the 2017 Savannah State of the Port presentation. So here I am again, I've just completed my rookie year, and I want to just say that I couldn't have had a better chairman. Uh, Mr. Allgood, as I always call him, was a great mentor, he was a great sounding board, a confidant, and just a wonderful leader for the ports. And I want to share that his wife, Kathy, actually, we had a team meeting, the Georgia she, uh, Ports leadership team, and she invited everybody over to the house, and just a wonderful people and great friends. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think, how did you like that video, by the way? Was that awesome or what? <laughs> My heart was racing. <laughs> I think this was an appropriate way to end the video. And you ask yourself, why is the state doing so well? We're just one piece of it. I think we all know the reason. The reason is that we have an incredible commander in chief in Governor Deal. For the last seven years, he's been laser focused on economic development and he and his team, guys like Pat Wilson and Chris Riley, take all the credit for bringing those businesses here. And we just want to say one more time, Governor, thank you for your leadership. We appreciate it. <laughs> GDED under Pat has just announced that 30,000 new jobs to the state, $6.3 billion of investment in just the last year, and if you look at the port component of that, it's 6,400 jobs and $1.7 billion. This is amazing stuff. This is not something that every state gets to stand up there and talk about. If we kind of just talk about the port's impact on the state, we have 1,200 direct employees that work for the GPA, but there are thousands of people working on our terminals, and we estimate through economic impact study that we touch about 370,000 jobs throughout the state in warehousing, manufacturing, logistics, and like. And here, just locally, you can see that the impact is about 40,000 jobs. So we all know the ports are important. We also know we can't do it without you. What I want to do at this time now is for the next 35 minutes or so, and I'll try to be brief, is take you through the ports, our terminals, our performance from last year. We're going to cover a few you know, big investments, infrastructure investments that we're making. And then we'll talk about economic development and wrap it up with our values, as Jimmy had mentioned. So let's talk about the ports. Garden City Terminal. I'm not going to speak a lot here about it because a lot of the presentation covers this, 
But let me just say the single largest facility in the Western Hemisphere, and this is the envy of every port operator throughout the country, bar none. It's a great asset among our toolkit. Ocean Terminal, a 200-acre facility handling brake bulk and rolling stock, equipment like rubber and steel, plywood, lumber, and things like this. Colonel's Island down in Brunswick, a massive row row facility handling cargo cars and heavy equipment. And then you go to Mayor's Point, a very small niche facility handling cargo like wood forest products for customers like International Paper, Georgia Pacific, Rainier, and West Rock. And then we have, finally, East River Terminal, a facility that we leased to Logistec, a Montreal-based terminal operator who does a wonderful job bringing new products. They developed a great deal of biofuels, so we're shipping ch uh, wood chips and wood pellets through this port. You add them all up, and how did we do? 33.4 million tons last year. 8.3% up year over year. That's almost 3 million tons. An incredible feat. It was, as Jimmy said, by all accounts, a record year. And I'm so happy and proud to be sharing that with you here today. So let's shift down to Brunswick, and we're going to give you one negative number, because we cannot tell a lie. At our small facility in Mayor's Point, we actually did lose about 200 tons. But this business actually just shifted to containers. It is not a loss of net business. And when you think about 200 tons over 33.4 million, we'll take that. Not a problem. I want to take you now to our row row facility in, in Colonel's Island. Row row simply means roll on, roll off. This beautiful Mercedes Benz was actually driven off this vessel. We handled 650,000 units. And when I say units, I'm talking about cars and things like heavy equipment like Caterpillar and JCB. The cars you see in Mercedes, BMW, Subaru, Toyota. But I want to share a special customer we have there, a Georgia customer, and they're here with us today, Kia. Kia is our single largest customer at the Port Authority. We want to thank you for your business. So we're going to, this facility is so large that you actually have to look at it from a satellite picture. You add up the campuses of Georgia, the Yellow Jackets and Chris, Riley, even the Eagles at Georgia Southern. That's how big this facility is. It's about 1,800 acres. I knew you old you Georgians would understand that kind of language. <laughs> Last year, I stood before you, and I talked about the facility being congested, wanting to expand the terminals. We could store about 60,000 vehicles as of last year. We brought a great project to our board. They supported it. And in just the last year, we've added 50% capacity. There was a little bit of risk to this, because we still have to lease the property out. And I'll tell you, as the property came online, it was leased immediately and sometimes before. We're finishing up the touches on that. We now have 50% more capacity, but we're not stopping there. We got 60,000 more vehicles of storage to build when needed, which totals 150,000 cars and equipment that we can store there. What does that calculate to in throughput? 1.4 million vehicles a year. How big is that in relation to the rest of the country? It's the single largest US auto port in the country in space. We're number two in throughput. So I'm telling you now, in the next five years, we are going to be number one. Our, cust our customers know it, our competitors know it, and we're really excited about it. We're going to leave Brunswick now, and we're going to go up to Ocean Terminal. Ocean Terminal, that break bulk facility, first half of the year, it's a story of two halves. We're going to talk about that in Garden City, too. The first half of the year is not the way a rookie really wants to start. We were down by 3.7%. And Jimmy and a couple of the board members, like Kevin Jackson and Charles Tarbutt, and I see Will McKnight, they had to walk me off the ledge. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't pretty. But I'm glad they did walk me off the ledge, because the second half of the year, we actually blistered it. We were up 11.6%, 683,000 tons. What are the kinds of products we handle? Wood pulp, liner board, lumber, iron and steel. 
This is a Southeast story. Not all terminals across the country are sharing these great numbers. The iron and steel is used to provide steel to the auto manufacturing located in the Southeast. We recognize that the Southeast is growing at 4.2%, while the rest of the country is somewhere in that 3% range. So something that we should celebrate. Ocean terminal, you add up all those numbers, 1.3 million tons, up 4%. And I will tell you that these numbers are effective from July 1st of 2016 through June 30th of 17. From July 1st of this year, we're doing double digit growth. So this has not stopped. We continue to plow ahead, and we're excited about that. We're going to leave Ocean Terminal and go further upriver to our Garden City Terminal. There was one thing I knew about this presentation when we started it. From the moment I saw this picture, I fell in love. And I said, this picture, whatever we tell folks, is going to be in this presentation. Besides its beauty, the reason I love this photo is that it captures the first time we had a 14,000 TU ship alongside our berth. It is also the first time that we worked seven cranes on one ship. I believe it's also the first time we had 6,000 moves on one vessel. There were a lot of people out there beyond Georgia that said, you know what? When you guys get these big ships, you're going to be challenged. Well, we proved them wrong, folks. Everybody did a great job on this. We handled it, it worked, and it departed. And now we're having more and more of those. These cranes represent a small portion of our crane kit. And I'm not going to go into all of our infrastructure investments, but I'll tell you that we have four more cranes that just departed the manufacturer in China last weekend and they'll arrive Savannah over Thanksgiving. And then we have six more cranes behind that being ordered. So over the next two years, we will be well positioned to handle more of these big ships than any other port in the US. So let's talk about the numbers. Kind of the same thing. We were positive, up 1.9% in the first half of the year, but not enough for the Georgia ports. And we had budgeted about 4%. We handled 1.86 million TEUs in the first half of the year. And for those of you who don't know, a TEU just means 20-foot equivalent unit. Why did we have a tough start? Firstly, Hanjin, our seventh largest ocean carrier customer, went bankrupt in August. We got up. We worked through it. It was painful. We kept forging ahead. The next thing that happened, in this time last year, I think most of you in this room remember Hurricane Matthew. There were some people on our team who said, Griff, do not show that picture. This is not the way you want to be given a state of the port. But that's not the way we do it. You know, we are not perfect. We know that. We're going to celebrate some great numbers today. But it's not about what happened. It's how you reacted to what happened and how you picked yourself up and moved forward. We had Matthew. We learned from it. The Army Corps of Engineers, the Coast Guard, CBP, and the whole community came together. And I'm very proud of what we did. Even though we were closed for six days, it hurt us. We got going again. Trey Thompson and his team did a wonderful job. And then we had Irma. And that was painful, again. And I know that some of you are still you know, working through that. And it's caused some interruption to your servers. But just know, this is the first time in 40 years we had a hurricane last year. One thing I was told when I moved here was, Griff, Savannah's great. It's beautiful. One of the great things is there are no hurricanes. <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've, been, I've now been in my, in the last 40 weeks, we've had two hurricanes, a bankruptcy, and a tropical storm. This is not fun, folks, let me tell you. So I'm going to move off of this picture, and we're going to talk about the second half of the year. 1.99 million TEUs. Why did that happen? Big ships. It was an incredible second half. Every month for the last 11 months in a row, we have been beating our year-over-year -year records. Let's drill down on that. What does it really mean? That was 11.6% growth. That is, that, for this size facility, that's the third fastest growing port in the world over that period of time. The only ports that beat us were in China that my New York tongue can't pronounce. I mean, this is incredible stuff that's happening here. So let's look at the five-year record. In 2013, 2.94 million tons. We weren't even at 3 million. 2017, 
3.85 million tons, a record year, 6.9% growth. And I want to stop here for a second. And, you know, I talked about the cranes, and I talked about the equipment, but it doesn't happen without the people. The GPA did a phenomenal job, the entire team, but we couldn't have done it without our partners. Our partners, and I'm going to, for the first time, call out the Georgia Steamship Association, the Stevedore Association, excuse me, Norm, and you're all the Stevedores, but we have with us today the ILA at all these tables. It starts with Alan Robb, the president of the South Atlantic and Gulf District. A phenomenal job, Alan. Your whole team did a great job. We got Dave Williams. They traveled in from Houston last night. You got Ricky Deloach heading up the clerks and checkers, Kerry Scott, the maintenance local, and then we've got Tim Mackey on ILA 1414, the longshoreman. And I'm going to throw out Paul Mosley, too, because he's done a phenomenal job in his role. Just a wonderful job. Thank you, guys. We can't do it without you. So 6.9%, what does that mean? Is that big, small? In seven, seven, I'm going to round up a little bit, because that's what I do. 7% growth in 2000 equated to 53,000 TEUs because we had a smaller base. The same percentage growth today is 270,000 TEUs added to our facility last year. The first terminal I ever managed as a port manager was in the year 2000. And the entire facility was 300,000 TEUs. So we are adding a small terminal to our facilities every year. And if you recall what I just talked about, about four years to get to from 2.94 to 3.85, it took 50 years for the Georgia Ports Authority to achieve 1 million TEUs. It's now taken us four years to add another million. So where are we heading? 3.85 for the year, 1.99 for the half a year. Chairman Olgood expects one thing from us. He expects me and the team to be reporting 4 million TEUs next year. And that would be the first terminal in the Western Hemisphere ever to accomplish this. And we're not gonna, we can't clap for that yet because we haven't done it. But I'm going to tell you, this is totally new territory. There is no terminal oper operator in the U.S. that understands what that means and how to operate in that environment except for us. And I think our customers appreciate that. So Garden City Terminal is the fastest growing port over the last 10 years. And yeah, you're going to hear some ports say, we're the fastest growing port. No, we are. I'm going to ask you a question. When you invest your money and you look at mutual funds, do you invest in the mutual fund that did really great over the last year, but they stink over 10 years? Or are you going to go with the port or the investment that's doing it every year, year in, year out? I think we all know the answer to that. Nobody's done it better than the GPA over the last 10 years. And I already mentioned as far as the third fastest growing port, major port in the world. And those other two ports were Ningbo and Guangzhou. We missed. Guangzhou by 0.1%. We would have had second place. So that's our goal next year. And that's only a six month window, but it's a great accomplishment. And then we'll look at the short term. This chart right here represents the growth, the additional TUs of the various ports in the East Coast New York, New Jersey, Virginia, South Carolina, and Georgia. There's only one green line, and that green line is the one that added the most. So I'll ask you who is the fastest growing port? in the nation, or at least on the East Coast, it is Georgia. Why is that happening? That's happening because of a thing called the Panama Canal. We are the largest trading partner with the Panama Canal. So when the Panama Canal expanded and allowed larger vessels to come through, all of the East Coast ports gained from that, but Georgia ports gained more. And this is a great time to recognize, I'm not sure where he's sitting, Oscar Bazan from the Panama Canal Authority, who's here to join us today. Oscar, thank you for your investments. We appreciate it. We appreciate what you did for us. Let's give him a round of applause. So these big ships, what does it all mean? In 1988, when I ended, entered the industry, the largest ship was actually 4,000 TEUs. Ten years later, excuse me, 1988. In 1998, the largest ship was 6,000 TEUs. It was the Regina Maersk, and I believe Maersk Line is with us here today, a wonderful customer. 2010, 8,500 TEUs, the Figaro. And I think at that time, everybody said, 
Guys, this is the largest vessel that will ever call the East Coast. They were wrong. The largest ve vessel to ever call the East Coast is the CMA, CGM, Theodore Roosevelt, 14,400 TEUs. Yes, the vessel is longer by about 200 feet. And yes, it's wider and it's higher. You can stack containers from the bottom of the ship to the top are 22 high. And if you add these vessels together, the two blue actually fit into the one green ship. 6,000 plus 8,500 is 14,400, right? Isn't it? <laughs> so what's 100 TUs among friends? <laughs> so um, I want to show you a video now. It's one thing see seeing an illustration, but this video truly captures what these ships are and what they mean to us. In FY16, 45% of all of our vessels were Neo Panamax. What that means is they were larger than 5,000 TEUs. That cannot, they could not fit through the old canal locks. We handled about 1,000 moves per vessel. Advance forward after the Panama Canal locks were opened last year, and now 60% of our vessels are Neo Panamax and growing, and we're handling 1,200 containers per vessel. Folks, that represents a 33% increase in the number of ship calls that are Neo Panamax and a 20% increase in average containers move. And again, I tell you that, that, goes to the, that the credit of that goes to the Panama Canal, but it also obviously goes to our customers. What it tells us is the more capacity that comes, the more we'll get. Take a look at this picture. You'll see the red at the base of that vessel. You shouldn't see red. We're handling these vessels, and it's great, but we're not able to fully load them. So we're still not there, and as the governor so accurately stated, we need to get SHEP finished. SHEP is more critical than ever. You know, you might have heard that the, the cost increased, but a lot of people aren't talking about the benefits. The benefits increased so much more than the cost. The old numbers, 5.5 to 1, this is a ratio, a benefit to cost ratio that the Army Corps of Engineers calculates. The new ratio, 7.3 to 1, what does it mean? It means for every dollar that the nation invests in deepening the Savannah Harbor, $7.3 go back to the nation in savings, into our pockets, because the cost of goods drops. The total cost was 900, is going to be $973 million. We'll round it up to a billion dollars. Is that a lot of money? No, it's not. Not for an impact like that. This is the largest impact on any navigable project in the nation. The net savings each year is $282 million. You amortize that over 50 years, that's a payback of $14 billion. Who wouldn't do that? And that doesn't even include the economic impacts that are driven and spurred by new warehouses and new cargo coming to the state and the southeast region. So the, the impacts far outweigh the cost. And I think the governor is absolutely right. We need to get that support. So let's take a look at what the project is. We'll move to the entrance channel. That's where it all started. It is happening now. The entrance channel is going from high water, 51 feet, all the way up to 56 feet. The project is 60% complete. These are pictures of the project actually happening. So this is not something we're talking about now. It's underway. We'll move up river. Another component or feature of the project is the dike raising. And this is being built to support the inner harbor dredging and also build the future base for the future Jasper Terminal. A really exciting historical project is the CSS Georgia, an ironclad vessel that was scuttled during the Civil War. These are artifacts being removed. It had to be moved out of the way so the inner harbor could be dredged. Substantially complete. Continue to move up the river and we have the oxygen injection system. This is a significant environmental mitigation project that will be completed sometime early 2018. It then has to be tested. That'll take around six months. Once the testing is complete, the inner harbor dredging can begin. And finally, another substantially complete, th that's the picture of that, and this will be done, as I said, in 2018. Another project uh, upriver is the freshwater impoundment system, substantially complete, provides backup water supply for Savannah. And the last project 
and the most critical is the inner harbor deepening. That will begin in 2018, and it will finish sometime around 2021. Overall, the project is 35% complete. The inner harbor goes from 49 to 54 feet. So overall, the project's 35% complete, wraps up in 2021. And I think that you know, we're there. We appreciate the support from the state. We're, we're making progress. Exciting to see. And you heard me say so many projects are substantially complete. But let's talk a look at the carriers and what's happening around the world. The way a port grades himself is how many services do we provide to our customers. Savannah is not third. We're not second. We're not tied for first with New York. We are number one for the first time in my lifetime. And I think that deserves a round of applause. Why is that happening? This is a picture of all the global carriers that existed, ocean carriers, in 2011. There were 18 of them. And I mentioned Hanjin. There's been a significant amount of consolidation. You advance forward to today, there are only 10 carriers left. There's a lot of reasons for that, and there's not enough time to go through it. But I want you to know that every one of those major carriers calls Garden City. And their decisions are allowing us to become the number one port in vessel calls. Now we're going to talk about some significant infrastructure projects. We have two railroad partners, CSX and Norfolk Southern. And we're really excited about what rail offers and providing alternatives to our customers. The first project the governor mentioned was the, Atla the Appalachian Regional Port. We, are, we have broken ground. We are moving dirt. This project will be finished in the fall of 2018. It will alleviate congestion in Atlanta. It's going to stimulate economic development up in northwest Georgia. But more importantly, it's going to be a catcher's mitt for all the cargo in these five surrounding states. What we're doing, folks, is essentially taking our gates that are now in Savannah, pushing them out about 350 miles, and we are now located, when this is completed, we're located at the back door of our customers, providing them alternatives to move cargo to the Georgia ports, locking in new business and new freight. We're looking at other facilities. We're looking at Northeast Georgia as well. In the 15-county area that makes the Northeast Georgia area, 2 million people. Distribution facilities are continually being announced in this location. So this is a place we want to be. We don't have a project yet to officially name, but we're taking a serious look at it. I want to take a moment now to talk about a new project, the Mega Rail and walk you through this really exciting development. The Georgia Ports Authority Mega Rail is a $128 million facility. $44 million will be provided by the federal government. Essentially what we're going to do is take two on-dock railroads that we operate, rail facilities, and make them one. We'll build 97,000 feet of rail track. While doubling capacity, we're going to reduce impact on the local community. We'll ease local traffic flow with a new overpass and ultimately come out with an 18 working track facility that is made of 40,000 feet of rail. This is a really significant project and I'm going to take it down now to take a look at that. We're looking at our existing CSX rail facility. And this train is going to take us to the new mega rail. So let's watch and see. Now isn't that cool? That is just cool. I love that. Folks, this is just one rail line, that's all we animated, but it's actually going to be six 5,000 foot connecting tracks. That new overpass that I described, trains now won't run into cars and trucks. And as this train turns the bend and approaches what we, where we normally work, Norfolk Southern trains, that's what it looks like today, the future is this. Eight rail-mounted gantry cranes capable of handling one million lifts a year. 
the single largest rail facility in the North America. It'll be completed by 2020. It doesn't stop there. What that does for us is it cuts transit times by 24 hours. It allows us to connect to locations like Chicago, St. Louis, Columbus, Memphis, and even provide better service to Atlanta. That's the other thing I think is really cool. That's our new logo, by the way. Now, that is the mega rail, but it really is about the Georgia Ports Authority Mid-American Arc. That's just a tool that allows us to do this. As these ships get bigger, they have more cargo on them, and they're going to call less ports. We want to be the port of choice for our customers. We are, and we want to continue to hold that. And so by allowing extending our reach into mid-America, that allows us to do that. The critical mass that these cargo ships bring will allow us to run 10,000 foot trains to these locations. There's just one thing we did wrong last year when we rolled this out. We forgot about the Gulf, and I'm sorry, Alan. But we were approached by a company called a &R Logistics, I think they're here with us today, and they asked us, hey, this GP Mid-American Arc thing, can we get in on that? Can we rail you cargo and have you handle it for us? And we said, absolutely. Where do we sign? So what does A&R do? They handle resins. This is a Wall Street Journal quote, and I'll read it, powering a manufacturing boom and an export bonanza. What are resins? Resins are in 70,000 products. They're in products like water bottles, telephones, carpets, and car parts. I'm so happy I never have to say that again because I practiced like 2,000 times. <laughs> but the bottom line is that this market's going to grow substantially over the next few years. They're essentially plastics. That's what re re resins are. The reason the market is growing is there are new LNG cracker plants being built in the Gulf, and the resins are a byproduct of those plants. And so we expect that this market will grow substantially. This is the first customer, and we're looking for more. And it provides great export opportunities for us. And the reason that A&R wants to come to Georgia, besides our great services, we have an ample number of empty containers that service those exports. So A&R, welcome to Georgia. We will be handling their first containers sometime in November and December of this year. Let's talk about some other really great new distribution facilities that are actually working now and moving containers through our ports. And they are all here today. Wayfair, I think John Esbron is here with us today. Tory Birch, Scott Campbell. And finally, Port Fresh. Rebecca George and her team are out there. I want to welcome you to Georgia. We talked a little bit about them last year, but now they're officially moving containers. Welcome aboard. I hope all is going well for you. We're so happy to have you. I mentioned Pat Wilson. I did not mention CETA, but I'm going to do it now. Guys like Trip Tolleson, Steve Green as the chairman, and all of the economic development authorities throughout the state. We rely on you to bring in the business. We just work the ships. And we're so happy that our economic development authorities are the best in the business. And as a result, we have two new announcements for you today. And those new announcements are Noble House, an e-commerce home furniture company that canvassed the entire U.S. East Coast looking for the one place to put their first distribution center. And I think you know the answer of their decision. They chose Greater Savannah, and we are so happy to have you. Welcome to Georgia. <laughs> Best choice products. Talk to them, they said the exact same thing. We wanted to set up an East Coast location to service everything from New York to Texas. And the reason they chose Savannah was because we're centrally located, we're close to the population base, we have a great port, and our economic development groups are the best in the business. So great job, and welcome again, best choice. That is only two customers, there's many more. And what's really neat about that, they're both e-commerce along with Wayfair, so we have a whole new segment of growth coming to us. E-commerce only accounts for about 10% of retail right now, so this is a market that's going to take off, and it looks like Savannah is in the heart of it. 
Okay, so last year I made a call to action to build more warehouse space. And I want to thank all of you because you responded. The Savannah community built 3 million square feet of warehouse last year. The problem? 2.8 million was absorbed. As quickly as the warehousing came online, it was snatched up. The problem is that as quickly as we're building it, the capacity is not growing. Five more million square feet under construction. And I'm telling you, that is not enough. You can see here in 2016, we had 2.4% capacity, and now we're at 1.96. The Georgia Ports has done their part. We just sold 500 acres. There were some folks that said nobody's going to buy it. We had people tripping over themselves to buy it. Jamie McCurry's closing those deals now. I want to welcome those new developers to us. Matter of fact, I'll tell you a quick story because I'm only at 34 minutes before I wrap up. One of the developers was a guy that actually owns the Houston Astros. And the team came in my office and said, Griff, could you give this guy a tour around the terminal? I said, who is he? His name is Jim Crane. He owns the Astros. I said, really? He comes in. He gets in my car. It's the day that one of the big ships was long, coming alongside. I said, come on, forget about the presentation. I want to show you one of these ships. I stopped on the way down. And I said, Mr. Crane, there's just one problem. And he said, what's that? And I said, I am a big Yankee fan. <laughs> How prophetic was that? The Yankees are going to be playing Houston starting Friday night. So, no, these are the types of folks that are investing in our port. This is a brand new developer, 3PL, and this is what's happening. Folks that have never worked in Savannah, never done business with Savannah, are coming in droves, and we need to provide the space for them to do that. Believe it or not, that is actually the wrap of our presentation before I get into values. And I want to tell you that I covered a few things, and I can't get into a lot of the infrastructure projects up here, but I want you to know that we are still going to do the blocking and tackling. We are still investing in the cranes, as I said, but we'll be adding 12.5% gate capacity for the trucking community this year. We know that we have work to do to add more capacity. We will invest $150 million in our facility this year, $2 billion over the next 10 years. So we're excited about where we are, we are so appreciative of all the great support we get from our local delegation and those throughout the state. I'm always amazed when I go up to, to Atlanta this past year with BART and how welcoming everyone is to the Georgia ports. We, we just can't thank you enough. And I want to tell you I'm so happy to be here at the Georgia ports because of the community. This is a wonderful community. I've never lived in a place with people as friendly as you. Sometimes I look at you like you're crazy because us New Yorkers, we don't always trust everyone. <laughs> so, so when you talk about community, I, and, and just want to say, I think, you know, when you think about capacity, we handled 3.85 million TEUs, but our capacity on our facilities right now before any kind of expansion is about 6 million. So we are in the, big, we're in the third or fourth inning of this game. We have a long, long way to go, and we have great strategic plans to continue to provide a congestion-free environment for our customers. And I don't think a hurricane is in our book every year for the next 40 years, for sure. So now, at this time, I would like to just kind of share with you something that, that is near and dear to my heart. And I asked our leadership team to come together about six months ago. And we wanted to work on a new mission, a new vision, and new values for the Georgia Ports Authority. But they really weren't new. We wanted to crystallize, memorialize the things that the Georgia Ports Authority has done so well and why are we successful? Let's put something to it. And I'm not going to share mission and vision because it's you know, too long right now and I'm at 37 minutes and 51 seconds. But over the next two minutes, I'm going to talk about those values. I just mentioned community. We want to care about our neighbors. We want to care locally. We want to care regionally, nationally, and globally. And I don't think there's a better example than just going back a month ago when Harvey hit Texas. We all watched and we were horrified at the scenes we were seeing on the TV. The Georgia Ports Authority team came together and said, what can we do to help? We called, I called my counterpart in Houston and said, Roger, what do you need? How can we help you? And he gave us a list of supplies because some of their employees lost everything. I think Robert helped me get on TV and I made a call to action. I asked folks to come and provide diapers. I called Paul, I called Tim, I called Ricky. And within minutes, we had people showing up to fill a container 
we wanted to fill one container to send down to Houston. Three days later, we filled four containers. And it wasn't we, it was you. And that's what I love about this community, and that is what the Georgia Ports Authority aspires to be. I want to show you now a video that Roger and his team sent back Thank to us. Thank you so much, Georgia Ports Authority and the entire Georgia community. Um, Port Houston had one in six employees impacted by Hurricane Harvey. And these donations that you all made to our community and our Port Houston family will make a huge difference for those that lost everything. I'm Nina from Port Houston Bayport, and I just want to send a special thank you. We really, really appreciate this. This is a generous, generous gift. Hey, Griff and uh, all of our friends from Georgia, the Georgia Ports Authority, your port community that uh, contributed amazing things to our people who were impacted by Harvey. I got to tell you, uh, it's truly appreciated by all of the people that contributed from, uh, from your port community. And I just wanted to tell you once again, thanks and uh, Appreciate you thinking about us. Thanks, Georgia Ports Authority! That is a great example of community. <laughs> Safety. We want everyone to go home the way they came. This picture is of Betty Ann Repay. She has gone, come to work and gone home the same way for 50 years at the Georgia Ports Authority. She was working at the Ports Authority the year that I was born. Okay, so that, that is commitment and that's safety and she's a wonderful woman. We're happy to have her on our team. Integrity, do the little things right even when no one is watching. We've all been there, we've all done that. If we can all do this, we're gonna be better. Respect, the golden rule. There's probably in our world today not a, a more important value than respect. We need to treat others the way we would have them treat us, okay? Can we do that? I think that's a simple thing. Creativity. I love this because the Georgia Ports has been the most creative port for many years now. And I only need to think back to Doug Marshan in the days when he appealed to the beneficial cargo owner to come set up a distribution facility in this little town called Savannah. We have this wonderful port. It's going to be a wonderful port. His team did a phenomenal job, and we are now building on that foundation today. Creativity is the GPA Mid-American Arc. It's the inland terminals. It's something we need to be more of and continue to focus on. This is not just about moving containers. If we do these things, and we make the investments, and we continue to receive the support from all of you, we are going to receive more and more opportunities. And we want to continue to focus on growth. And at this time, I just want to say thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything you do for the ports. I'm saying that on behalf of the team. I can't wait to see you next year. And Bill will have a video for you again. All right, take care now. Everybody enjoy. <laughs>